The 2009 FME International User Conference keynote presentation is presented by James Fee, a geospatial technology manager and associate with RSP Architects. James is a recognized leader in geospatial and web-based mapping technologies and is an active blogger at spatiallyadjusted.com. James really doesn't require much of an introduction. I'm sure many of you, um, you read his blog. Um, he's a great speaker and um, he's, he, he's a good friend of both Dale and myself. And um, so we'd like to have James come up, and he's going to share some of his thoughts for the next 45 minutes. All right. Um, my name is James Fee. I, um, I blog. <laughs> That's what many of you know for, uh, about me. I also work for an architecture firm. And actually, safe FME has become really important to me as I'm trying to transform back and forth between CAD and GIS. That's become kind of a, one of the bigger things that, that, that my company's been looking at me to do. So it's been really exciting for me to get more involved with SAFE in the past year. So it was really a big honor for Dale and Don to invite me to come and talk. So uh, hopefully in the next 45 minutes we'll have some fun. Uh, the early years of mapping, map making, uh, probably really started back 15,000 years ago where some guy from France drew a picture on a wall. And a lot of people say, oh, that's cool art. But really what he was doing is he was creating a map showing you where the good hunting was and where the, the horse was and the guy, things with the little antlers. Uh, so it was really kind of the first map. It was someone saying, here, I've got some information, and I would like to share it with you or whoever happens to walk by this cave. And pretty much for about 15,000 years, not much changed. Right? People would create a map, and they'd write it on a piece of paper, on some slate, on a rock. And they go hand it to someone or put it up in a, on, a, on a wall and hope that someone would walk by it. Well, then computers came along, right? And you had these huge, huge computers that were created, I guess, for World War II and census and all those other things. And you'd have a guy with a typewriter and a woman in the background flipping switches to try and share data. But the problem with this is these computers were built one off, right? So you'd have someone would have a Honeywell computer and your friend would have an IBM computer. And despite the fact you could write to these these tape drives, you couldn't share data because unless you had exactly that computer model that was built, you really couldn't share it. And even though it was really great because you had all these women working with you with beehives, you really, you really couldn't get anything done. Uh, it was still, you had all this processing power and you really, everything you did, you did internally. It was like you were walled off from the world. And I think part of the, one the probably my first experience with sharing data happened when these things happened in the 70s, right? When you I remember my dad going to these, these user uh, meetings, these user groups, right? And he'd come back with this cassette tape with all these little programs on it. And I don't know if you guys remember that. You'd have it start at counter 103, and you'd have to, you know, fast forward to 103 and make sure you had the data. But you were finally able to share data back and forth. Uh, but cassettes were really a big pain because you really still couldn't share uh, data easily because you had to write, you know, write it out. It would take time. And then computers like my TI-99-4A didn't talk real well with your Sinclair. So we still really couldn't share data back and forth. And then this happened, these disk drives. That was like the coolest thing I remember growing up, was having these disk drives because then you'd get information from friends and you can share them. It was also great because people, everyone had an Apple or they had an Atari or they had you know, a VIC-20. And so you were finally able to actually produce something on your computer and then take it next door and have your friend read it. Uh, so floppy disks were really great, except for me, you know, I remember people sending me floppies from around the world, and they come wrapped in, in tin foil. Remember that? Because you were worried about someone x-raying your floppy disk and losing all your data. Or even worse, right? You remember span disk spanning? and you had a huge data set, and someone would send them to you, and you, the first floppy would say one of 24. And so you'd start counting your disks, and you'd realize you only had 23 of them. And so you, you'd basically lose everything. So if, this was not a really efficient way of transferring large data. Sure, if you had a text file or a little CSV file, it was great. But once you actually had to really share data, it really wasn't that efficient. But then this thing came out, right, the modem. And that was really cool because you could finally not have to worry about how you got data. You just fired up your modem and you connected to a bulletin board service. And those are really great. I mean, most of the stuff you found on there was probably illegal. Uh, but finally, you could upload a file and friends could dial into that same 
BBS, assuming the blind wasn't busy, and download that file. One of the first things I remember in college was working with census data, and I remember dialing into the, the, the census BBS to download the latest, uh, I can't even remember what it was, block group data. So we would dial into this and, and navigate this goofy textual base interface and get the data and download it. So even back then, you know, people were thinking about ways to share it. The problem was, right, your mom would pick up the phone when you're downloading. Or someone would dial in and you forgot to turn off your call waiting. So you basically lost everything, unless you had one of these special downloaders that you, know, you could resume. So it still wasn't really efficient. Uh, but then Usenet groups, right? That was a great way to share data. I remember one of the greatest things in college was cruising these things. I wasn't really too concerned about studying. I was more concerned with seeing what people were talking about. And I, you know, I found this on the Google, and this was interesting. This is from 92, and there's someone complaining about ARC Info back then. Uh, you know, your problem is you're using ARC Info. <laughs> But at least you could, but, and then people would, would upload, you remember the binaries, and most people think of those as, you know, pornography, but you could share spatial data. I remember downloading spatial data off of Usenet groups. So it was finally a really great way, but it still really was really narrow, right? Because you, you, if you were in a university group or in a, in a government organization, you had access to this, but, you know, my, my dad on CompuServe, he couldn't get to it, at least initially. Eventually they added that. But... You know, around the mid-90s, you finally started the, you know, having the World Wide Web come out. And, you know, you have Esri, it was a website, and Autodesk, and they had, you know, where to get data. And I found it interesting, from 96, it's Autodesk, it says, you know, introducing map guide. <laughs> you know, get your vector data on the map or on the web. So I thought that was kind of interesting back in 96. They, people were finally thinking about how do we share vector data on the Internet. And, you know, maybe it's unfortunate we really haven't come that far since then. Uh, and, of course, here, SAFE was on the Internet back in 96. So uh, they were doing some sort of transformation there, Don, right? Something to something. Uh, and, of course, Tiger Data, right, it's, was available on the Internet. But this was, you know, sort of a problem because you remember they had TigerLine files. Like, what the heck are TigerLine files for most people? So you still had that problem of you had data there, but unless you had a reader to actually read the information, it really was almost, you, you couldn't do anything with it. Uh, and then FTP, right? That was the big way. In fact, a lot of us still look at FTP. You know, I don't want to deal with, with HTTP. Just give me an FTP site. I'll come download as much data as I can. But FTP is not a really good way to share data because it's not really secure, and you have no idea who's actually downloading your information, and is it valuable? You know, what data layers are people getting? You may have spent, you know, all this disk space on one file, and nobody's downloading it, and you have no way to track that. So it's, it's... It's kind of a give and take. You know, one of the guys I work with, if he can't download with FTP, he doesn't want to bother with it. He'll find someone else to download the data. So, and then, you remember this? This was awesome, actually, when you think about it. It was a great way to search for data. You draw a little box on a map and get spatial data. The problem is, is everybody was really quick to enable their services in the geography network, but nobody took the time in figuring what was my long-term investment in offering my data. So you'd say, sure, here's my ARC IMS service with whatever, I'll register it, and then four days later, you just take it down. But the geography network would still show it up, so when someone's searching for it, they'd say, hey, it's broken because none of the data is available, everything times out. So you still, you were starting to get near the end of what a great sharing site was, but you still didn't have really people buying into the idea that I'm going to share data and I'm going to ensure that it's going to be readily available at all times. And, you know, right now these are some of the ones, geodata.gov, CalAtlas, you know, there's just uh, a lot of sites that kind of have gotten beyond where maybe the geography network was, oh, I guess almost 10 years ago, to now, but it's still not really a great way to share data. We still find ourselves fighting through these systems. Uh, I guess right the future, this was at the WARE conference. Everybody kept talking about data.gov. Finally, we have a data portal site we can use. It's like, I guess. So we'll find out. Um, so what are the keys to a data portal, right? If I'm sharing data, what's important? Well, open format aggregation, right? We all know about open formats because we use, uh, you know, FME. But if you don't use FME, if you're, if you're offering up proprietary formats and nobody can consume them, you know, nobody's going to leverage your data. So you need to make sure that if you're we're going to be participating in a portal that you are offering up data formats that people can read. And, you know, we all know what those are. Findability. 
once you get to the site, how do you actually get the data? You know, it's not so much that you can just type in data.gov, which is easy to do, but how, how do I get to the end when I get to data.gov to actually get my data and get it in a format or, or a method that, that actually works for me? And then caching. Uh, that's one of the things that I've come to a conclusion on is, you know, from sites such as the Geography Network. The service, if people are, are participating in this GeoWeb, right, they're offering up their own servers to be part of this. And things happen, you know, I, you know, your IT department takes down your network over the weekend and doesn't tell anybody, but that happens to be the one time that people try and access your data. So if there can be some sort of caching of these services to enable people to access this stuff, or, you know, if, if Katrina happens, right? Well, if Katrina happens again, uh, everyone wants to access the, you know, the, the flood information, flood plain, 100-year flood plain. Well, if everybody accesses it at the same time, it's not going to work, especially if it's a WMS service. But if it's a cached tile service, then everybody can access it at the time they need it. Uh, so open format aggregation, we'll talk about a little about this, right? Support for open standards. So, you know, KML, KMZ, PDF, XML. But, you know, depending who you're talking about, are shapefiles in open format? Eh, maybe. Uh, but you talk to someone else and they, you know, they basically tune you out, like shapefiles. Uh, Excel is an Excel open format. Well, sort of. Right, because the new Excel format, I think, is an ISO standard now, but is the old one? I don't know. But if everyone can read the format, does that make it open, even if it's a closed proprietary standard? And then the other thing you need to do if you're going to be a data portal is you need to aggregate other sites. So I don't want, as a user, the idea that data.gov would be the data source. They're just helping me find the data. I like the idea that the Centers for Disease Control is actually worried about the swine flu and not data.gov, or FEMA's worried about flood zones. They're the people that I want to go to to get the data, but I need to figure out how to find them. And maybe I, as a GIS professional, know that FEMA has flood data, but maybe somebody else who's a neo-geographer doesn't know that. How do they get to FEMA by going through a site such as geo or data.gov? And then pick any format, right? We talk about this. I, I, I actually, when I first saw this, I kind of didn't really feel it was right, but the more I think about it, this is a great way to get data, right? XML, CSV, uh, KML, ESRI, which is, I guess, shorthand for shapefile, and other. I mean, that's really, if you're sharing vector data, that's really all you need, or, or databases. So trying to make sure that whoever's going to come to the site then actually can download the data. Now, this doesn't transform it or anything like that. I mean, if, if, if you click XML and you do a search, you're only going to find XML data. You can't take a CSV and convert to XML, but at least it's a start. These are great formats to work with. Uh, findability, right? How easy it is to discover data. That's part of it, right? Or the other thing is, once I get there, how do I get to the end and actually get to the data? Is it, you know, I can go to data.gov and I can type in to find something, but I am really only successful if I actually download that data, or at least determine that the data really wasn't there. If I can't make that uh, discover, if I can't discover that on, uh, when I'm there, you know, it's almost a failure. So, you know, I thought we, you know, two weekends ago, I guess, well, more than that, uh, Memorial Day, we were driving around Arizona, and my son had never seen an open pit copper mine. Uh, and, you know, if you've ever seen these things, they're, they're really striking. <laughs> you can't miss them. So he wanted to find, you know, more information about it. So I thought, we'll just type in Arizona copper into data.gov. It'd be a great way to find it. So I found these couple results here. Uh, and it's kind of nice. It shows you KML and ESRI formats. And I thought I had something there. But I realized, you know, looking at the metadata, it really wasn't finding Arizona copper. It just found the words copper in the metadata and described it. So to test that, I thought I'd type in Hawaii copper in the search. And that second result says it excludes Hawaii and Alaska. So the data search is really almost broken in the sense that it's just searching textual. It's not searching it from a spatial method. So I, I, I'm getting results in a textual search that aren't helping me. And then you type in something, you know, I thought, well, what about unemployment? Data.gov, that should have information. It tells me no records are found. And I was thinking that's something where is my search broken or do they not have data? And you're thinking, well, data.gov should have unemployment data for the United States since it's kind of a big topic right now. So it kind of makes you wonder. You start you know, changing your, your search parameters, you know, jobs or losses or other things. So you have to think when someone goes to your website, if you're, the, if you're FEMA and someone types in floodplains and doesn't get anything, flood zones, 
you know, you got, you got to test to figure out why people are there and what information they're going to get to. And then caching, right? <laughs> uh, this poor little girl, she just wants to take a sip of the hose, and her dad is probably just really squirting it in her face. Uh, but you think about, she's trying to offer something up, right, when, when something happens, like Katrina. So that happens, I'll go into this a little bit with our, one of our clients later on. How are people going to access that data when they absolutely need it? So just looking at data.gov, they don't cache anything. These are just, if, if I type in weather and I get those KMLs, they just go to, to NOAA's website. And, you know, if NOAA, depending on how, where NOAA's website is when a national disaster happens or, or how popular one data set is, I might not be able to get that information out. And depending what I'm needing to do, especially in a natural disaster, uh, I need to make my decisions really quick and get them done right away. And, but it's still okay, because I actually like data.gov. You know, they got this nice pages where you can get information about that, all different formats. It would be nice to transform some of these formats on the right. Uh, but then you can rate things and put comments on it. So it's, it's really a great start. It's just early on, and you hate to pick on a site when it's out for the first month or two. But, um, you yeah. know. So, again, open formats, findability, and caching, those are important. So what is it? You know, we talked a little bit about open formats. And I was talking uh, to people in my architecture firm, and I said, is DWG an open format? And they all said yes. And it's like, it just really depends on, you know, what your environment is. You know, I don't really consider DWG to be a very open format. But if, you're, if you have AutoCAD, <laughs> to you it's a very open format. Uh, you know, personal geodatabases, are they an open format? I can read it without Esri software, right? But it's still one of those formats you sort of can read and it's nervous. And, File geodatabases you can't read unless you have Esri's formats. And then we got to thinking about if Esri releases an API to read a file geodatabase, does that make it open if they control the API? So, you know, this whole, whole idea of open, what, how open is open and what is open, I mean, people at the WARE conference were ready to fight over what a, an open format was. You know, map info, same way. Mr. Sid, some people say, well, it's open readable, but it's not open writable. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, we can probably agree these are probably real open formats, right? Shapefiles, KML, GML, SDF, XML, PDF. You know, PDF, people always seem to forget, is, is, is very open. It's, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. It's not, you know, Adobe sort of controls it, but it's, you know, it's, an, it's a standard now. Uh, and then you have to pick your target audience, right? You see this guy? Look at those books he has. He's got solid state physics, CSS, all this stuff. So he comes to your website. He's going to want raw data. He doesn't want a PDF of your data. He wants whatever went into that because he's going to tack it up with something. And then that, that nun right there, that cyber nun, she has no idea what to do with that. She, a PDF. She didn't even want a KML. She just wants a PDF that shows what she wants. So you have to balance these two users. And some data sets probably skew toward the nun, and other data sets skew to the hacker. Uh, so you kind of have to figure out what your users are going to do with the data you have. Are they going to need, you know, just a PDF picture of it, or are they going to need the raw data to be a neo-geographer? Then how they might use it, right? Professional applications. You know, I, a GIS professional, a CAD professional, they want that raw format to work with. Uh, neo-geographers, who the heck knows what they want, but they want something really fast. Uh, my wife, she's a, she's a budget analyst or something like that. <laughs> she doesn't know what I do, and I don't really know what she does. Uh, so it's, we're, we're even. But she likes to work in Excel. So she wants tabular data that's easily open in Excel, right? Uh, PowerPoint. How much has everybody been told by their boss, I just want it in PowerPoint? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice just to get a PowerPoint <laughs> slide, <laughs> save all the problems? Google Earth, right? Everybody wants it in Google Earth. How can I view this in KML? And then Photoshop. It's oddly enough, I work for an architecture firm, and the final piece of software they use is, is, is Photoshop. You know, that's their, they do all their work and then they gussy it up in Photoshop to make that's the final product. So that's, you know, that's what people are using some of this data for. They're not necessarily always, how am I going to open this in ArcView or open this in AutoCAD? They're going to use whatever piece of software they want. So it's kind of nice to know how they're using the data. And then you want to be careful of exposing too much, this poor little girl, right? So she has 230 some odd formats that can be thrown at her face. She should probably drown. So you just have to figure out what is that nice thing. And that's why I like this, right? That these little guys right here. This is a nice, fair way of sharing data. 
So then findability. I thought, well, after where, Google had all these great examples of, of searching with Google Maps for spatial data. So, ah, that's cool. So I thought, well, let's, we're doing some uh, threatened endangered species in California, so I'll do a search for that. So I did the search, and of course it didn't come up with any spatial data. It just came up with you know, whoever paid to be uh, listed first in the Google search. So I couldn't find data with the Google. So I went to the California State and did a search there, and I got some PDFs and some HTML files. Uh, but that didn't really help me, so I hit advanced search, and you get the Google search appliance. And I thought, oh, cool, file format drop down, no spatial formats. So eventually I figured out, oh, that's right, they have the Cal Atlas. So I thought, well, I'll just search that. And it's really nice. You move the window around and say, I want Southern California. And I do a search, and I got like 588 results, except I have no idea what half of those things are. And then when you look at the results, there's some of them that have nothing to do with threatened endangered species, you know, biking trails and build the county buildings. It's, it was confusing. But I, I clicked on the first one at the top, and I said, you know, what does that get me? It gets me some metadata. So I'm looking at it, and it's, you know, it still doesn't give me anything. So I look at the, the, the raw metadata, and you know, here's the site to go through it. Bam, another portal. After all that, I have to go through another data portal to get my information. I mean, at that point, you just say the heck with it. You know, it, it, it's very frustrating. So that's really what you want to do is make sure that when people are going through this process of getting data, they get to the result or they're just going to give up. And maybe I give up easy. <laughs> and maybe some people are a little more, uh, will fight through it. But I just, it really was unfortunate for me to get to that, all that trouble of getting that data and then get the end and having to actually copy and paste the URL and it takes me to another portal. But this is still a good search tool, right? Having the, 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 the map to do my spatial data and just typing some things in. And I think they have, you know, data types. I don't know what GIS applications are, but I know what maps, web services, and GIS data are. So it's a good start. Uh, one thing I do like about is, is the Wio Geo one because this, this is really easy. So you just, you know, you go to your area, you just keep panning through this thing, maybe just some, some settings. You get to a list, you pick your list. I wanted an aerial of my house, an update aerial. So I picked one. You can see the little box showing me where the aerial is. I can read about it to figure out how, how great the data is. And then, hey, I can view it in, in Google Earth, right? So I can check this out before I download it. And I can see, hey, it overlies my house. It's what I want. Go through, purchase it. Yeah. I get to the end, right? Because I, I, I got through and I got my data. And that's a really, you want, you want people pointing at you and saying, yeah, good job. You don't want them to say, eh, I never really got, I gave up. So that's what you want to make sure is what's, the, what's not only once you get to, your, to, the, to the site to ensure that, you know, the data exists to make sure that you get to the end and actually be able to download the data. And then caching. Again, at where someone said this, Google does it so it must be smart. Okay, uh, you know, but caching I think is really good because it ensures data is available. Uh, this is, you know, some data set that I'd shared with somebody a couple months ago, and our IT staff deleted the file because they clean the drive out every month. Well, that person had the link somewhere, and they click on it, and it takes you to this 404 page. Uh, you know, that's, so they would download it, and they'd say, hey, I didn't get the data. Well, why did it take you a month to download the data? Well, it just happens. You know, you get busy, you forget about it. Um, the other thing with caching is it speeds delivery, right? People expect Google Maps from us, and it's really hard to do. None of us have the Google servers behind us. Uh, so we want to try and eliminate dynamic services that don't have to be dynamic. We can cache it, and people can get it to appear right now. Um, you know, so many things people say, oh, you just did that KML, and you can view it in Google Maps. Well, it takes a couple seconds for that KML to appear in Google Maps, right, as Google reads the KML in. So sometimes people wait a couple seconds, and they see nothing happens, and they backspace, and it ruins your home application. So you want to try and cache this stuff as much as possible so that people stay at your website and stay working it and, or, and continue along with the workflow you've given them. Because if people start backing up in your workflow, it, it really creates problems for them, and you can't figure out what they're trying to do. Reducing server loads, right? I, I don't know about you guys, but when my IT staff gives me a server externally, it's basically on its last legs, right? These servers are about ready to die, but they're, you know, they'll throw you a bone and say, here's this old Pentium Pro server. You can use it externally. So whatever I do on that server has to be really efficient. I can't afford to have these fancy 
uh, dynamic services because they just run really slow. Which leads us to the cloud, right? Because that's, that's the great solution to all our problems, right? Uh, so data, you know, as I was saying, data sharing is very expensive, right? You need bandwidth, and not all of us have great bandwidth. We have DSL and cheap T1 lines, so we don't have all this great bandwidth to share data. You need a lot of disk storage. People say disks are cheap. I, I don't know. Whenever I try and buy disks for my server, they seem really, really expensive. So disk drives are cheap if you're buying them for your, your home workstation, but if you're buying them for your server with redundant disk arrays, they cost a lot of money. Right? Processing power, you know, my Pentium Pro, it's, it runs Windows 2000 really well, <laughs> but it doesn't run ArcGIS server or anything else at all. Scalability, the idea that I may serve something up and it might be interesting to five people today, but, you know, Earthquake happens in Arizona, and I have earthquake faults in Arizona. Everyone wants that data set that day, and nobody can find it. So, you know, what, what's the optimal method of sharing data, right? Well, whatever it needs, it needs to be the system of record, right? Because if I'm going to be sharing data, I want to make sure that data I share is the real data, not what people might have on their laptops. So if I'm the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, for example, and I have critical habitat, Whatever critical habitat is up on my data sharing site, that is the, the data set. It's not some intermediate data set. Uh, institutional repository, right? If we're sharing data and everybody's storing it on their local computers and we're doing some sort of sneaker net thing, you're not really going to get the, the optimization of your data store. So you need to make sure people are storing it on your data storage site. Uh, Web-based access. If you're going to access this data uh, from remotely around the world, you know, I, you don't want to have to download some client to, to access it. I just want to go to a website, type in my credentials, do a search, find it, hit download. And then I already showed geo-enabled search. So if I'm searching for copper in Arizona, I only want a result of sites or data sets that are in Arizona. I don't want to see data sets that are, are not in Arizona because I just really don't care. Uh, and then high performance, right? The whole Google Maps thing. I need, I don't have time to wait for all my servers. So as much as I can do to optimize my map services, uh, you still need a product that people are not going to bail on you. And really, you have to be Google fast. And then customize your quest, right? Spatial ETL, we all know about that. It's not so much that I can download Tiger data for the United States. I want to just get something specific out of it. So how do I transform it into something else and get exactly what I want, rather than taking my bandwidth to download a whole huge data set. Then pay as you go, right? Uh, I can't afford all these servers. Every time a new server comes out, it costs, seems to cost me $10,000. And $10,000 here, $10,000 there, pretty soon you got a million dollar system. So what I want as far as a data sharing site is I want to have something where I only pay for what I use. I pay for my bandwidth, pay for my disk storage, pay for the processing power. That needs to be IT friendly, right? If your IT staff is going to support you, they need to buy into it. So uh, it can't be this you know, fly-by-night site, you know, the James Fee data repository you know, that's hosted on his computer sitting in his house. It needs to be, you know, they need to feel that the data is secure and it'll be up and running. So you've know, you got to key remember them. And then easy upload methods, right? Data is only as good as the data that's in there. So if, people, if it's a big hassle to get data into your data sharing system, whether it's registering a web service or actually uploading the data, uh, if that process is difficult, you're never going to get there. Uh, and then on the last one I added recently was generate revenue. Uh, working with nonprofits has been interesting because they really enjoy sharing data. But if you're CH2M Hill or URS Corporation or some Bechtel, you probably should be doing some lifting. And so if they could charge engineering companies, large engineering companies, reasonable rates for the data that helps them ensure that people, other nonprofits or individuals can download the data as well. So it helps them fund their whole process. And then all this whole spatial data infrastructure, right? That's the whole big thing, Inspire and all. You know. But the focus has been on national governments, these huge, big systems. But the higher value of sharing and collaboration happens down in the weeds where we are. You know, how do I, as, a, as, as an architecture firm, share our data models with other architects, with other cities in our area. You know, do I have to ramp all the way up to data.gov and then go back down to the bottom? Why can't I share my information across everybody at that level? And I think that's where we're going to see the real power of it. Um, because you get your own personal geo web, right? 
that it, you don't have to be the, you know, a state, uh, a country, or a huge organization to be a part of the GeoWeb. You can enable it yourself. Uh, and so one of the great things we've been able to do is with this New Orleans Data Center. And uh, right after Katrina hit, uh, they basically found me, I guess, off my blog. And they had a problem. They had, this was their system before, Windows 2000, Arc IMS, and Cold Fusion. And you can make a lot of money consulting on these products. But if you don't have, you know, these guys, the Geek Squad behind you to help implement this, you're just not going to get this product done. Things need to be serviced, services start, fail, stop. You know, how does it work? So the staff, they're just a bunch of people trying to democratize data. That's their whole big thing. These, they just want to get information out to people. They don't have time to log into the server, hack some XML, uh, ensure that whatever is going on, or even do a search, you know, get on IRC and ask a question, why is my geo server down? Uh, they don't have the time. So what we did is we took that old system and moved it to a more of an open system, so getting rid of Windows 2000 and going to Linux you know, opens up a whole lot of stuff for us. Getting rid of Cold Fusion and going to Django, you know, a lot more open framework. And then because what they were serving up with Arc IMS really wasn't dynamic, we basically just said, let's use Google Maps because that's what people are used to using. You know, the average person that comes to their website, you know, they've used Google Maps. They may not be experienced with some of the, the, the GIS clients that we voice to Palm users when they come to our site. So what we wanted to do was cache these maps. They've got these rich cartography maps that are built in ArcGIS. And they look really nice, and they were serving this up with, with uh, ArcIMS. But we wanted to get them to cache, and we wanted to store them in Amazon Web Services. So we were using this product called Arc to Earth to create these tiles. Uh, but Arc to Earth, it still happens on the client. And what we're worried about is if they get updates to tiles and they have to evacuate, you know, if this process takes a day to cut tiles for all of New Orleans, they may not get it before power goes out, the internet goes out, so they couldn't get the update. So we've been working with, uh, with SAFE and WeoGeo to basically move this processing into the cloud. So they could basically upload a new data set, have some sort of uh, symbology with it, and then basically say run, and then they can evacuate, and while they're going, the cloud, Amazon Web Services, is generating these, this tile cache. And I guess, you know, even on your, is there an iPhone app for FME server yet, Don? OK, yeah. So eventually, you could get on your iPhone and check how your, your, your server's running. And, and for them, as they're evacuating, as they're file, oh, here's a Starbucks. Let me pull in, get some internet access, and find out how it's going. So it's really good for them. And the end result is, well, here's, this, is, this is the whole workspace. The end result is you get a map that was as powerful as ArcGIS was with the cartography, but is easy to use for the users because it's in Google Maps. And they know how to click on these links and how to zoom in and turn on the street view and all those other things. So it's, it's been really exciting for them. Uh, and then the other thing is we've been moving, with our workflows, we've been moving data into the cloud. So we've gone to Django. And the idea was that rather than having these static HTML pages and GIFs and JPEGs of, of data formats, is normally, you know, we have, you know, write out of the shape file, but that green one at the end there, that's writing to the, the Google spreadsheet, Google Docs spreadsheet. So essentially you get an inline spreadsheet in our web pages that is updated dynamically when they run these scripts. So they could get new data ingested into WeoGeo, run the script that would then populate all these things automatically. So they don't have to worry about what servers they have. Well, they don't have a server. They just have a bunch of people with laptops that happen to work in one office. And the result is that you, you know where all the data is, right? It's all up in the WeoGeo library. It isn't on each person's individual computer. Or, hey, was that the one workstation we left back in New Orleans when, when the next hurricane hit and got destroyed? Uh, so some of the technology we're looking at this, right? so we're looking at SAFE and WeoGeo, the Amazon. But the other thing we're bringing into this is Salesforce. And we're working on this right now. If you go to the, the gnocdc.org's website, there's a, on the right-hand side, there's a Ask Allison link. And basically, that's how people request data from the New Orleans Data Center. Uh, they go in and say, hey, I need uh, child care centers in the Lower Ninth Ward. So it comes into the Ask Allison email system, and then they assign it to somebody who creates the data and shares it. 
right now that happens kind of haphazardly. Someone creates a, you know, they just email, forward the email to somebody and, hey, do this, they do it, and they email it to the person that requested it. But what we want to do is make this a little bit more efficient in the sense that the request comes in. So if you go to the, well, not right now, but when you go to the new site and you click on it, it, it basically creates a record in Salesforce saying that so-and-so has requested uh, child care centers in the Lower Ninth Ward. So it comes into Salesforce and then gets assigned to somebody. So that somebody would say, hey, I, we've got data in the Wii Geo library. Let's create a, a workbench script to actually ingest that data and create an output. So they do that, the output goes into Wii Geo, and then Wii Geo tells Salesforce, hey, the data's been created. Salesforce then sends an email off to the person who requests the data saying, hey, the data is up in the library. Go ahead and download it. Person sees it, clicks on the link, goes to Wii Geo, and then uh, downloads the data. And Wii Geo tells <laughs> Salesforce, hey, so-and-so came and actually downloaded the data. So you know, hey, that not only did they request the data, but they downloaded it. And then you can also check to see how often they came back to re-download that data. You know, are they deleting it? Are they sharing it? You know, how, how interested are they in the data? And then let's say in another six months, they get an update to the child care centers, right? So they upload the new child care center data to Wii Geo. Well, Wii Geo knows that here are these workbench scripts that generated these products. And Salesforce could then look at those and say, hey, these are the users that actually we sent data to. And they could decide, yeah, we want to, you know, I want to send an email out to these people because they are interested. And then you can send out new emails to them saying, hey, here's updated data, go download it. Uh, and you can see how many of those people actually came back six months later and downloaded the data. So you can kind of keep an eye on who's downloading your data and make sure that these people are getting what they really want, uh, as opposed to just having an open system where everybody just comes and downloads it. You have no idea what people are getting at. So that's been kind of a really interesting thing for us is figuring out, you know, it's, it's the whole analytical part of data sharing for, for the New Orleans Data Center. Because, they're, you know, they're a nonprofit and they get funding basically based upon how, how much, what kind of data they're sharing, who are they sharing it, what the product is. And it's really important to them to make sure that, hey, if we're investing time to create these products, that people are actually using it. So, you know, it, it's really interesting for us as, as to just when this gets deployed here pretty soon to see how well this is all working. And I think this is kind of interesting in the fact of data sharing is when you get down really low, you don't have the time to waste creating data sets that people aren't using. Maybe if it's a big organization, you're just pumping out data sets left and right. Uh, it's not a problem. But when you've got this small staff that basically is sharing data for all of New Orleans, they want to make sure everything that they, every product they create out of, out of their library using FME is a product that people are using. And if they're not, if people aren't using it, to stop running it. Uh, so, I, you know, the results are, you know, there's no lock-in. So they, they're, they're really happy with the idea that in, in, in the olden days, <laughs> with old GIS servers, you basically were very locked into this server. And you could get a new version, but it was, you really had to start from scratch. So what they like about uh, FME is the fact all these new transformers and things happen, and they can write to different formats. And, and what Denise said to me is they're no longer fighting change but embracing it. So they don't have to worry about some new format coming out and how it's going to affect them. They look at it as a more positive thing. You know, this whole Google Maps data API. Uh, what is that going to mean for them? In the past, they might have been scared of it. Oh, I don't know. What is, but now, eventually, there will be a, a writer, reader writer for that. They can figure out how do they best leverage that to get their work done. So for them, they go from kind of fighting change to just saying, cool, what's this new technology? How can we use it? How can we get data to our clients better? So, you know, that, that brings kind of to the end of it. You know, for me, the whole idea of FME has really been liberating uh, the whole process. And I, was, I was talking to, to Ed Catabaugh last night from Microsoft, and we were saying kind of in the old days when you ran scripting, there was really, there's a hundred ways to, to, to get a result. And then we kind of got into this wizard-based processing where pretty much all you did was press next, and it didn't matter who was doing the ana analysis, all you had to do was hit next, and you could find anybody to do that. For us, FME is really great because we can explore kind of different ways to use the data and different ways to get to a result. 
And that's kind of, it, it, it helps us fine tune what we're trying to get to. And I, you know, I, as I appreciate, you know, both Dale and Don and everybody at SAFE for continuing um, giving us new product and, and, you know, just being able to say, here's a new uh, Transformers, uh, here's new writers, readers. That to me is really efficient for me who's trying to make sure that my clients have exactly what they want. So um, that's pretty much my talk for today. Uh, if you need to get a hold of me, there's my uh, email address, uh, website, and you know, I'm on Twitter like everybody else. Uh, so if you want to you know, contact me, ask me any more questions, I'd be happy. <laughs>